You're listening to Hebrews Jesus is Better series, preached by Pastor Rick Dressler at Maple City Baptist Church in Chatham, Ontario. For more information about Maple City, please visit us online at maplecitybaptistchurch.com. If you have your Bibles this morning, please turn to Hebrews chapter 12. We're continuing our study in the book of Hebrews. We're almost finished after over a year now, I think. And we come to Hebrews 12, verse number 18. And this morning we're going to be talking about a rendezvous with God, about meeting the God of heaven. Verse number 18, for ye have not come, and then he goes on. Uh, But it's important that for is there to remind us of what was just said. So, for, he's about to give instruction now, but we must remember who he's writing to and what was just said. And here's what we've learned over the last several weeks. That the writer of Hebrews has a pastor's heart. He wants his people to run the race and run it well. And so he says, there are some things we can do. Like, we must then follow after two things. We must follow after peace with all men and follow holiness without which no one can see the Lord. And so we got that. That's where we run the race. And then he says, there's some things to flee. And what's interesting is he uses a plural verb to say, not just I want to run well, not that you should just run well, but you all should run well, that we're in this together. And he says, see to it, watch, be diligent, look out for one another. There are things that you should flee from that will deter you and us as a body finishing the race. He says to flee the failing of grace. When the church becomes graceless, when we forget what Jesus Christ has done, it's just a matter of time before the church becomes harsh and rigid and self-righteous. So flee that as a body, as a people. He then said, flee the foothold of bitterness. In any relationship, in the church, people get hurt. And we must be willing to give it up, to let it go. Flee the foothold of bitterness. It ruins everything within. It warps and destroys the soul. And then he says, flee fleshly, irreligious behavior. And what he's getting at here is just not not only our position of holiness in Christ, but the practice of holiness in Christ. And the practice that we are called upon in the culture that we live. So that's who he's writing to. Hey, run the race, run well, and I want you to consider something now to maybe help you stay on track. He says, for you have not come onto the mount that might be touched. And if you've not chimed in yet, as soon as the writer of Hebrews makes this statement, The church, these Hebrew believers, would know exactly what mountain he's talking about. It is Sinai, Mount Sinai. It is where after the Lord redeemed his people through many wonderful works, he would show one of the greatest displays as he comes down on this mountain to meet with his people. And notice what he says about this mountain. He says, you, believers, in this this little church that he's writing to, you have not come to Mount Sinai that could not even be touched. Why can't you touch it? Because it's dangerous. And why is it dangerous? Because God is there. And God is holy. My brother and sister, I don't think we spend enough time thinking about the pure holiness of God, that he is other than what we can imagine He is uniquely distinct from everything. We talked last week about the sun being 93 million miles away, and yet that same sun at that distance will burn us. And it's not like, oh, sun, you're so evil. Why would you do that? No, the sun is just being the sun. And the closer you get to that sun, the more dangerous it is for you. This is our God. He is holy. He is pure. And anything unclean or dirty will be destroyed in his presence. And so he says to his people, I'm coming down. You dare not touch the mountain. I am holy. We've got to be careful. This morning, God is not who you imagine him to be. 
God is who he said he is. And if you have this notion that he is some senile old, old man wanting everyone to have a good time, you're sadly mistaken. This God who came down is holy. Don't touch it. And then he says, uh, look what happens when he comes down. There is fire and darkness and gloom and tempest. Listen, we have been caught in different types of storms, but this is the storm you don't want to be caught in. Because it will take your life. He continues. On this mountain experience, their rendezvous with God, there was the sound of a trumpet. Now, I don't know about you, but every time I read this, my mind naturally goes back to the days of recitals for our children. And years ago, we had a recital for Gregory, who played the piano back then. And we were, at the time, it was just the three boys. It was me, Kim, and the three boys. We were sitting there ready for Greg to do his recital. And the, the violin teacher brought her students as well. And, and wouldn't you know it, the first kid out of the hopper is a violinist who I'm sure never touched a violin in his life. Because when he started, it was, it was like, honestly, it was like fingernails on a chalkboard. And so we have these three young and immature children, and they start laughing. Second row, the teachers are behind us, and they're shaking because they're laughing. And Kim, as a good mom, does the mother, ooh, stop it, no. And then she looks over at me to support her in her decision, and I too was young and immature. <laughs> it was horrible. It was horrible. But that's not what's happening here. This trumpet here is like a siren, it's like an alarm. And, and in Exodus chapter 19, it gets louder and louder and piercing and piercing. And the terrifying thought of this is. It's not being played by human hands or human lips. This mountain is smoking. This mountain is on fire. And sirens are going off. And then he says, the sound of a voice. A voice. Voices are powerful. But this voice was such a voice that they had never heard that terrified them. That they said, stop! Stop! Yahweh! Yahweh, stop. We don't want to hear this voice. Speak to Moses. Because this is disconcerting, to say the least. And then this in verse 21, which I'm amazed at. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. This is Moses, the man of God who was familiar with God, who had encounters with God, and yet this sight makes him very frightened. The whole scene is fear, trepidation, um, sheer awesomeness. And not awesome like, dude, that was awesome. Like, awesome, we just should have died. Awesome. And here is the picture of Mount Sinai. The picture he's painting to remind believers, you have not come to this mountain. It is a picture of God's holiness. And it is terrifying. It's terrifying. And not only is it terrifying... This God of Mount Sinai, you don't approach him. You don't waltz into his presence. You dare not do it. Now, notice verse number 22. This was their rendezvous with God. But believer, here's what he says. But you are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. If you don't know, Zion is synonymous with Jerusalem. That's what, when you hear Mount Zion, it's Mount Jerusalem and the beauty, the real beauty of Jerusalem. This city was the temple. The temple. Because that's where God met with his people and that's where God would take unclean people and through the sacrifices make them clean. And you notice immediately the contrast here. Mount Sinai, death. Like, death. Don't touch it. Mount Zion, the city. City, they have people. Except for Merlin. Cities. <laughs> right? It's life. It's lively. This is the city of the living God. The heavenly Jerusalem. He then goes on to say, with an innumerable 
angels who are gathered. And that phrase is fascinating to me. It has the idea of a gathering, but not just getting together. It is joyous. It is happy. It is festive. It is literally a party. What a contrast. The church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. I love that. I, I love the church of the firstborn. The church of Jesus Christ. The only true church. These are the ones who are enrolled now in this city, enrolled in heaven. Then he goes on. He says this. Uh, I don't know what verse I'm at now. The judge, verse 23. And, and to God, the judge of all. The one who will make all things right. In this mountain, there is justice, and justice reigns. I don't know about you, but this week I'm longing for justice to reign. And I think of a day when justice will reign. And the writer of Hebrews is telling us as God's people, we have entered into this rendezvous with God where his kingdom is righteous and just. And there is coming a day when he will make everything right. Everything. It goes on. This, this mountain, Mount Zion, the spirit of just men and women made perfect. Perfect. So perfect that my voice went when I said it. Perfect. Being in accordance with what God requires. This city, men and women are made just. Their lives are in accordance with what the holy God requires. These people are righteous and in right relationship with God. And look now at verse 24. Because this is the crown jewel of all of it. And to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. The reason the city is what it is is because of Jesus and his new covenant. His blood is salvific. His blood is efficacious. His blood is not like Abel's. Abel's blood cries out for vengeance. This blood cries out for forgiveness and reconciliation. This is the blood of sprinkling. Whereas Mount Sinai, there was terrifying holiness of God, which is unapproachable. Here on Mount Zion, there is the tender and transforming holiness of God. And God is not only approachable, we have unimpeded access to the living God. Do you see the picture that's being painted for these believers who are called to run a race and to run it well and to run it together. He's saying, listen, you're not called to Mount Zion, Zion or Sinai. You're called to Mount Zion. Now, some of you this morning after hearing this will say, oh, yes, yes, this is the problem. That God of the Old Testament is a God of vengeance, a God of wrath, a God of fire and storm and touch it, you die. That's why I like the God of the New Testament. And if you think that this morning, you are sadly mistaken. And you stopped reading a little too short. Because he continues now. In verse 25. Speaking to those who have become part of this mount, Mount Zion. See that you refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. From heaven. Whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I will shake not the earth only, but also heaven. These people who are now in Mount Zion, he says, Hey, pay attention. Listen to the voice that came from Sinai because that same voice, the voice of Jesus Christ, will not only shake the world, but one day it will shake both heaven and earth. And this mountain, Mount Sinai, is terrifying to the lost. Mount Zion is a powerful encouragement to the saved. But I want you to know the God of both of those mountains 
is the same God. He's the same God. The God of Sinai is the God of Zion. And the God from whom we need to be saved from is the very God who saves us. He saves us. The difference comes in that this God took upon flesh. The holy, perfect, terrifying God wraps himself in the flesh of a child. Would anyone expect that? What is more disarming than a child? I know for men it's like, oh my goodness, they're scary. But the fact is they're babies. They cause no threat, no problem. And this Holy One takes upon flesh and something amazing happens. That when the Holy One of God, Jesus Christ, touches that which is un unholy and unclean, he is not defiled at all. What he touches becomes clean. Like clean. Like righteous and just. And notice what he says. He says, once more, I shook the earth. I will shake heaven and earth. Does it not seem today like this world is shaking? I mean, think, th just the last couple weeks in our church, in our government, in Afghanistan, we look around and it seems like everything is unraveling. He says, once more though, I'm not just going to shake the earth. I'm going to shake all of it so that, he says at the end of verse 27, that the things that are shakable will not remain, um, and those things which cannot be shaken will remain. They will be unshakable. And then he says this, verse 28, Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. My brother and sister this morning, the world is shaking. There's coming a day when heaven and earth will shake. But I want you to know, in everything that's been said and done in our world today, heaven is not moved. Heaven is not moved. Nor will it be moved, nor can it be moved. You and I have a kingdom that is unshakable. And as everything around us is shaking... We have a kingdom and a God who never changes. And so he says, runner, church, running together. Finish well, finish strong, follow, flee. But remember, we're not on Mount Sinai. We are on Mount Zion. And because of that, he says, let us then have grace. Which literally, literally means, let us be grateful. Sometimes believers who understand what I just said about this Mount Zion who we've come into relationship with God, we have this idea then that that's great, I'm in, and that's it. I've arrived. Here I am. Come once a week, I'm good, I've arrived. That's a problem. Because you should finish the rest of the chapter. Because he says in verse 29, our God is a consuming fire. And he's talking to us. And that phrase comes from Deuteronomy chapter 4 as Israel's getting ready to go in the land and, and, and Moses is reviewing their history and their life and he's saying, listen, God is a consuming fire. He is a jealous God. And it's a rightful jealousy, jealous, jealousy not for his people to worship anything or love anything but himself. And he deserves that. This God wants all of you because he purchased all of you. Every last square inch. And the writer of Hebrews is telling us who are running this race, understand what you have. And in light of that, be grateful that this holy God loves you. When um, John Bunyan was preaching, and, and we had this idea of Puritans that they were just so stoic and unkind and you know, rigid, but he kept on preaching about how much God loved his people. And he preached it over and over and over again. And finally, a man said to Bunyan, stop telling people how much God loves them because they will do whatever they want. And some believers think that. But you've missed it all. Because Bunyan responded and said, 
No, if I keep on telling them how much God loves them, they will do what he wants. And if we could get a picture of what the writer is saying here on everything we've been given and the love of God for you and for me, we would be grateful and we would keep his commandments because we love him. And so, I submit to you this morning in closing that to those who have been watching this world shake and knowing that it will shake ultimately, everything will shake, that the only proper and appropriate response to the tender holiness of Christ and the unimpeded access to God is this. Verse 28, Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, let us be grateful, whereby we may serve God acceptably, acceptably with reverence and godly fear. If you don't know Christ this morning, you better understand God is holy. And there's nothing that you can do, there's no religion you can follow, there's no amount of works, that will make it safe for you. We are unclean and we are unholy. And, and we can put all the external stuff on, but when we peel back our hearts, they're filthy and they're vile and they're wicked. And the truth of the matter is, you know this, if we could go into your mind for the last week and put it on the screen, no one would be sitting in this room. Nobody. Our God knows. You must come to Christ. The only way to be safe is through the blood of Jesus Christ. But church, I'm speaking to you now in light of what he has done for us. Two simple responses. Number one, obey. Obey. And stop talking about all the scripture that you don't know what it means. What about what you do know it means? And what about how God has convicted you this week? and every moment, and in your relationships, and at work, and in the church. You know what he said, and out of gratitude this morning, we as God's people who love him and understand his love should simply say, yes, Lord, yes. Obey. Obey. And so, we need to obey. And then he says, to worship. Let me give you two definitions of worship as we close. This comes from Frame. He says, Worship is the entire Christian life seen as a priestly offering to God. And when we meet together as a church, our time of worship is not merely a preliminary to something else. Rather, it is the whole point of our existence as the body of Christ. We are called to worship. Giglio says this, Worship is our response, both personal and corporate, to God for who he is, and what he has done, expressed in and by the things we say and the way we live. We as God's people need to see him for who he is, and we must worship. We must worship in awe, adoration, adore, in praise, in love, in gratitude, to worship our God. And listen to me. When we are worshiping him, that does affect how I live outside of these walls. We've got to be careful. We can raise a hand on Sunday morning, and I'm going to worship. I'm getting my worship on, like some stupid song says. I'm about to get my worship on. That drives me crazy, like really crazy. That's why you shouldn't listen to fluffy music. It does nothing for you. I get my worship on, and I leave here and forget that I have come not to Mount Sinai, but to Mount Zion, and this God loved me and redeemed me and made me holy, the one who, who didn't deserve any of it. He's redeemed me. I'm the apple of his eye. I'm to worship him when I leave this place, in my home, as a husband, as a wife, as a teenager, in my place of work. By the way I live, it shows and reflects the glory of this God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so this morning, my brother and sister, run the race. Run it well. Run it together. Together, we finish well. But you cannot forget, we don't come to Mount Sinai. That's terrifying. We come to Mount Zion, and Christ paid the price. And the Holy One made us clean. And out of gratitude today, like just start today, obey what you know. 
What, what's the one thing right now in your heart that you say, ah, oh, Lord, uh, scripture, uh, prayer, witnessing, kindness, social media, get rid of it. What? What? Obey. Obey. And let's live a life of worship. We don't think enough of Calvary. This morning, the baptisms. What a picture. Christ died, was buried, and rose again. And we die to self, are buried to the old man, and we walk in newness of life. And may we do that today as we consider, consider our rendezvous with God. It wasn't on a terrifying mountain. It was on Mount Calvary, which changed everything. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your kindness. Lord, what we've witnessed in these acts of obedience has blessed my heart. It stirred me, Lord, to see your kindness and your goodness and the grace that you've given to your people to obey. And now, Lord, we understand that we need you. Lord, we thank you for what you've done in our lives. And God, help us to live lives now of gratitude as we consider Mount Zion, that place of life and joy, and justice, and just men and women who are enrolled there. May we this week, starting today, be obedient. And may we worship you in spirit and in truth. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.